right, hey, what's up? Welcome back, I scooted over here a little bit so we can use this space. Um, in this video, we are gonna break down some of the basics, discuss when and how EQ is used, clear up some common misconceptions, and give an overview of the frequency spectrum. First, what is an EQ? An equalizer, as you're almost definitely already aware, is a tool used to manipulate the frequency balance of an audio signal. EQs take shape in many different ways. There are software-based EQ plugins, like the ones you use in your DAW. There are hardware EQs, like the outboard gear at professional recording studios. There are EQs on guitar pedals, on some combo amps, in car sound systems. Even iTunes has a built-in EQ you can mess with. They can be found and implemented in basically any audio system and are used in every stage of the music production process. What do I mean by that? Music is produced over four distinct stages. Pre-production, production, mixing, mastering. EQ, as a tool, can be found in each one. Maybe not as much in pre-production, but constantly during the other three. During recording, the artist might use an EQ pedal in their electric guitar chain to clean up the low end. The recording engineer might run the vocal signal through a hardware EQ. During this stage, EQ is used to shape the incoming dry signal and get it as close as possible to the final desired product. During mixing, EQ is used constantly and on basically everything. It is the yin to compression's yang. It could be subtle, dramatic, Anywhere in between, you could use an EQ on a single audio track, you could EQ an effect like a reverb or something, you could even EQ the mix bus, you could literally EQ anything in the session. And finally, during mastering, you guessed it, EQ is also used to shape the final stereo mix. So, zooming out, there are a lot of different ways EQ can be used. For us though, in this course, we're not going to dissect every possible situation or circumstance in which you could use an EQ. We're gonna be focusing in on one specific application, the tone shaping EQ of an audio track during the mixing stage. When mixing any given audio track, whether it's a vocal, a bass guitar, a snare drum, you might run that signal through a series of plugins, creating what's called a processing chain. The processing chain might looks something like this. First, it'll hit an EQ, then maybe a compressor, then maybe another compressor, then maybe some type of saturation or distortion or something, and then finally, another EQ. The actual plugins, effects, and order obviously vary wildly depending on the instrument, the song, and what the track actually needs, but just for our purposes now, let's assume that this is a typical processing chain for any given track. This EQ over here, the last one, is what I call the surgical EQ. Over the course of a bunch of dynamic processing, there might be some lingering, unflattering frequency buildups, and this guy's job is just to subtly notch those out, clean it up a bit, he's the icing on the cake, he's the quality control. In this course though, we're gonna be exclusively looking at this first EQ in the chain. This guy is what I'm gonna call the tone shaping EQ, and it has a big responsibility. As the first plugin in the chain, its job is to, one, remove any unwanted noise, rumble, or buzz in the track. Two, notch out any overly present problem frequencies, and three, cut or boost large frequency groups so the track just sounds how it's supposed to sound. The first EQ, having so much responsibility, is often dramatic and aggressive. You'll see that as we move through this course that I am not gonna be pulling any punches here with these EQs. I'll be making huge boosts, massive cuts, big shelves. I'll be pushing and pulling tracks until they do what I want them to do, which is actually an excellent segue to the second big point of this video, EQ misconceptions. I wanted to just quickly address the two most common ones. The first one being, don't cut or boost more than 3 dB. And the second one, boost wide, cut narrow. Now there's a place for these. I mean, it makes sense that these general guidelines are floating around the internet because they're a good reference point for someone who is just 
picking up an EQ for the very first time, and they're completely on their own, because these rules might not help get the track sounding great, but it will definitely prevent you from accidentally totally ruining things. So again, they have their place. But with that said, the truth of it is that I, as well as every other working professional, cuts and boosts however much they need to in order to achieve the sound that they're going for. No one is thinking, oh, I better back off. I just boosted by 4 dB. No, they're using their ears, they're trusting their judgment, and they're turning the knob as much as they need to until they get what they want. Same goes with the width of cuts and boosts. I'm using my ears, trusting my judgment, and making any given cut or boost exactly as wide or narrow as it takes to capture the frequency range I'd like to adjust. So I encourage you from here on out to take the same approach. Be bold, use your ears, and don't worry about the rules. Which brings me to my final topic of the video, breaking down the major regions of the frequency spectrum. Because how are you supposed to use your ears if you aren't familiar with the major frequency groups and their functions? We've got going from left to right, lows to highs, the low end, the base of our song. This is primarily where the kick drum and the bass guitar live, the fundamentals being usually around 75 hertz and 85 hertz respectively. If there are any guitar, piano, vocal content down here, it's usually just unwanted rumble and you can cut that out. Next, the low mids, the body and punch of our track. In isolation, these sound pretty gross and unflattering, but they're essential in making sure that our song feels full and impactful. You'll find the fundamentals of our guitar, piano, and vocal tracks down here. Next, the mid-range, the central element. Usually containing a bit of every instrument, this region can get crowded, so it's where you'll most often be notching out specific frequency buildups. The smack of the snare, the vocal, and the guitars all primarily live in this space. Next, the high mids, the brightness and attack of our song. This region is where you can boost any given track if you want that track to cut through the mix. The top of the vocals, strings, synths, and the attack of all the drums all primarily live in this space. Last, the highs, the air of our song. While piercing in isolation, our highest frequency range gives the song a sense of shine and lift and crispiness, and it's an essential component in getting the song to feel loud and in your face. Except for the kick and the bass, most other instruments have at least some presence in this space. Training your ears to be able to consistently identify these regions should be one of your main short-term goals. We wanna get this skill up and running as soon as possible. You don't necessarily need to worry about being able to specifically pinpoint frequencies, but you want to get to a place where you can hear a guitar track, let's say, and immediately go, oh, it sounds like there's some weird frequency buildup happening in the mid-range, I should notch that out. Or, oh, the highs are a bit too bright and harsh, let me jump in and see what I can do. General things like that allow you to move more quickly and EQ more confidently. Whew. All right, that's it for now. We covered a lot. Let's head to the next video, do some final housekeeping stuff, and then we'll be ready to jump in. 